さあそれでは第2部セッション1東アジアの戦略的安定法第2部セッション1 Strategic Stability in East Asia and Okinawa Let me introduce the panelists From the center of the stage Ambassador Shinsuke Sugiyama Former Japanese Ambassador to the United States Uh, Mr. Bonji Ohara, the Senior Fellow for Security Studies Program at Sasakawa Peace Foundation. Dr. Akiko Yamamoto, Associate Professor at the University of the Rukyus. And the moderator is served by Ms. Keiko Izuka, the Senior Political Writer and Editorial Writer of the Yomiuri Shimbun. I'd like to hand over to Ms. Izuka. Ms. Izuka, please take the floor. Thank you for your kind introduction. So let us start part correction. Let's let's start panel session one, strategic stability in East Asia and Okinawa. So we'd like to talk about fifteen years since the return of Okinawa. Let's take that as a basic perspective and talk about this topic going forward. So first I would like to invite former Japanese ambassador to the United States Ambassador Sugiyama for his remarks. And also if I may point out, as a moderator, I really have to work hard. I have to be very punctual because the time is quite tight today. So therefore, as far as the program is concerned, I would like to ask each panelist to spend roughly 10 minutes or so for the initial presentation, if possible, to keep it within eight minutes, if you can do that, and then use the rest of the time for discussion, at least time some time allowed for Q&A. We'd like to take some questions from the floor to the end. So it's a very busy program, as you can see. So to appreciate your kind cooperation when the time comes, I will be very blunt and tell, and tell you that it's time to conclude. So I would appreciate your cooperation in advance, Ambassador. The floor is yours. Thank you, Ms. Izuka. Uh, I will uh, follow uh, the, your uh, the lead. Now, I would like uh, to show you a map at the outset. Now, during the keynote speech, uh, Michael Green has presented for more than an hour. I have been very close uh, to the Michael Green uh, the, from uh, our young days for more than 40 years. Uh, it, it is less than five decades, but uh, on uh, this uh, the issue, I think he is one of the most authoritative uh, experts, and he has mentioned all the right things that need to be said. And it is quite difficult uh, to, uh, to give uh, some painful uh, advice, uh, but I was, have listened carefully for uh, his recommendations. Now, I have taken this map from the Minister of Defense. And I don't think uh, I need to explain in detail to the people of Okinawa, but uh, I have uh, come to Okinawa yesterday, and it's about 1,550 kilometers from Tokyo. It's about 650 kilometers uh, to Beijing. And to Seoul, it is uh, 1,250. It's much closer than uh, Tokyo. Palau and Marshall Islands, they are Pacific Islands. So they are very distant, but geographically, they are actually within the same cultural sphere, if I may say so, or geographical sphere. So Okinawa is truly located in a very strategic uh, position geographically. I wanted to show you these numbers uh, to illustrate my point. More than a year uh, ago, I was within the government of Japan, so I don't want to criticize the Minister of Defense. Uh, but uh, it says that uh, try to maintain the deterrence with the U.S. forces and try to lessen the impact on Okinawa. This is actually the reverse. We should try to lessen the impact on Okinawa and at the same time to maintain uh, the deterrence with uh, the U.S. forces. So the order of uh, uh, the sentence needs to be reversed, actually. And the second point I would like to mention is, can I see the second slide? This is something well known to many of you, so I don't think I need to explain in detail. Can I have the second slide? Or maybe you can see at your leisure 
Now, Okinawa is included in uh, the first island chain, and Guam is included in the second island chain. So I don't think uh, I could contain within eight minutes to try to explain the difference between the two island chains. But in any case, I wanted to show you for this map. I'm not trying to criticize Minister of Defense, but in saying the same thing, what you need to say and phrase should be as follows. The first thing we need to think about is uh, during the Second World War and as uh, it has closed to the end of Second World War and uh, under Article 3 of San Francisco Peace Treaty, uh, the uh, rule and control of uh, the United States and uh, for or well, ever since then, uh, 50 uh, years, uh, 27 years after the end of the Second World War in 1972, at last Okinawa uh, was reverted to Japan. Uh, the impact, uh, the excessive impact the very heavy impact on Okinawa, even after the return uh, to uh, Japan. And uh, I had to have not been involved directly, uh, mostly, but uh, as a government official, I have been involved in U.S.-Japan relations. And uh, Okinawa, uh, having only 0.6% uh, of the land area uh, of uh, Japan, 70 percent. Mike was saying 80 percent, but uh, the uh, U.S. forces in Japan facilities are concentrated in Okinawa. Uh, this is a re really a grave reality. So the excessive impact felt by Okinawa and uh, the daily livelihood of the Okinawa people needs to be improved and supported. I'm not trying uh, to pick uh, the uh, details, but uh, I said the order should be reversed is because I was a government employee. So uh, I do uh, realize myself uh, that uh, uh, I should reflect upon my own uh, uh, actions, uh, that I had to do more. I should have done more, and not just words, but actions matter for the Futenma uh, relocation, the SACO uh, the head agreement uh, uh, established in December 1996, even after two decades. Uh, the Futenma uh, airfield, the air base, uh, is uh, said to be the world's most dangerous military facility, but it is not yet relocated. No substitute has been established yet, even though the government has done a lot in trying to gain the understanding of the people of Okinawa. We should uh, try to do more in trying to reinforce uh, the U.S. security uh, regime and also uh, try to lessen the impact on Okinawa. As Michael was saying, uh, we are not uh, talking about Ukraine as a topic today, so I would not uh, try uh, to go into details, but just one word. Uh, the, at uh, the, uh, the United Nations Conference on International Organization was held in San Francisco from April to June of 1945 in establishing the United Nations with the Nazi, uh, the Germany uh, that has collapsed and uh, the U UN Charter uh, the formulation uh, was uh, had to be uh, done uh, and uh, the system was created which included uh, the defect of uh, uh, a country having a permanent seat in the U United Nations Security Council. Uh, if an aggression is done by the permanent seat holder, nothing can be done uh, by the UN Security Council. This is a wake-up call. This is the first time. It is not the first time. Back in 1945, from the times of the Yalta Agreement, uh, the Prime Minister Churchill and the Stalin had a big fight. Churchill said that if and when the permanent seat holder uh, becomes an aggressor, uh, that you who will become a judge as well as an aggressor and also a referee, so to speak of, this is something wrong. Uh, he, it may be rather devious, so he it has made uh, mentioned this possibility. Uh, and Roosevelt uh, was too sincere 
Uh, but uh, they thought that this would never happen. But uh, this was thought to be a defect right from the beginning, as Michael has been suggesting. Uh, the Ukrainian question is not just a question from uh, Europe, uh, of course. Uh, for uh, the North Korea and China, uh, there is a lot of impact. Right now, because of Japan-U.S. alliance and the security uh, treaty, uh, of course, for the defense budget uh, uh, trying to be increased uh, to 2 percent or so, the debate is happening. But uh, we need to forestall the situation, uh, try to uh, to, to have uh, the perception uh, to look forward. And that is the important point. But in order to make this happen, we need to have a public acceptance and understanding of the local people. The importance of Okinawa uh, is uh, indeed very relevant in this regard. The time is up, but there are several points that I would like to still make, as Michael has said, and what Ms. Izuka uh, has uh, asked a very sharp question. Only 70% or 8% military facilities are concentrated in Okinawa. What are we to do? Uh, he talked about extended uh, uh, deterrence. That is not to do with extended deterrence directly. But uh, Michael has to think about what is debated domestically. Not in my backyard, NIMBY question. So in terms of general argument, uh, something is fine, but not in my own backyard. You don't want uh, to have certain things close to home. Of course, there are historical developments in the United States, but the uh, U.S. forces uh, are concentrating its facilities 70 percent in Okinawa, but I don't think the Americans are also thinking this as a good thing. Now, time is running, but I felt keenly that Michael and other experts of those professionals, including myself, uh, who have been dealing with uh, uh, the Kim uh, Moon, we know of this very clearly. But uh, when opinion polls are taken in Okinawa and also in the mainland, there seems to be slight disparity. But when you go to the United States, when I speak with Michael, he knows everything, so he understands. But for example, uh, with uh, the Senator Lees, uh, right now it's Senator Menendez, uh, who is the head of uh, the, uh, the Committee on Foreign Policy in the Senate, they don't understand. And James Mattis, uh, General Gen James Mattis, he went to Albania and so forth. And uh, he is uh, the, uh, the, uh, the general hold of uh, the Marine Corps. Whether they do fully understand what is happening in Okinawa or not, that matters. The government of Japan needs to address these people and have communication with them. For example, uh, Secretary Austin or Secretary Esper and also uh, Secretary Mike Pompeo. Uh, during my own time, whether you have addressed these people. That has been too weak. We cannot just speak to experts or authorities. We need to speak to those people who matter. And why is it difficult uh, to speak these matters uh, directly? Uh, since I used to be a government official, uh, it, there are some difficulties involved, but if I dare to say those, of Futemma, it's more than two decades since the agreement of Seiko. Why can't we bring solution? Uh, Futemma is the most dangerous military facility on earth. But uh, a, a person who says that you are anti-US or anti-facility, this is the criticism uh, I get. And some Americans, or many Americans, actually think that that would undermine the US-Japan Alliance. Michael is different, but when I spoke to Senator uh, Menendez, uh, even the head of uh, the Foreign Relations Committee of the Senate, they don't really understand. That is because we haven't explained clearly from our side. We are a democratic nation. So, of course, uh, there are diverse views. We are a democratic nation, so there are many different views, including anti American or anti-facilities, but majority of the Japanese people
think that we need to do something about Futenma, 70% concentration of youth force in, in Japan, Okinawa, something has to be done. But at the same time, we need to reinforce uh, the uh, Japanese security, the defense capability, uh, defense budget uh, needs to increase to at least 2%. These are happening in parallel and simultaneously. Sorry, I have taught that land, sorry. Thank you so much. You were on the front lines in Washington. You were the ambassador. Thank you so much for sharing with us your perspective, and you've been very punctual. Thank you so much. Now next, Mr. Ohara, please. Yes, thank you very much for this opportunity. Today, I would like to talk about how we can maintain international order, and what about the role of Japan, and what about Okinawa? From that perspective, I would like to talk about the security situation in East Asia, and then talk about the impact of the Ukraine war, and also what we need to think about going forward. I hope to cover those topics in the course of my comments today. So let's start with the first slide, please. Thank you. First, let me talk about China. What is the current, how does China see the current situation? Up until now, China was concerned that uh, deterrence based on nuclear could not work. For example, the number of warheads and also the number of um, launchers were so there's a gap between US, uh, US and China. That's why China was concerned up until now. Now, this is a map of which I'm sure you have seen from this. This is the Pacific seen from the Chinese perspective. This is the image from the Chinese perspective. So what is our message here? Okinawa, naturally, geopolitically speaking, is very important. But it's not just that. East China Sea, South China Sea, in North Korea, Russia, if you take a look at these regions, then Sea of Japan, all these regions need to be covered. That relates to Japan as a whole, Taiwan, Philippines, Malaysia, all these countries are included in that map. That is what I want to say. Next, as far as China is concerned, China is concerned that uh, nuclear deterrence would not work. That is why they're focused on A280, which is anti-access air denial. They have been constructing anti-access air denial. In a nutshell, it means in the first island chain, U.S. and allies would be included in other forces. Their activities would be denied. In the, and in the second island chain, what would happen is that U.S. carriers and strike carriers would not have access to China mainland. So, in term, so intermediate range ballistic missile would be utilized to counter any vessels of, of the U.S. So you know, China isn't just talking, they're actually walking the talk. This is the satellite. It's from the Takamaka Desert in China. These are the missile targets that are con being constructed in Takamaka Desert. This is actually copies carrier. The, the line is uh, railway, 40 kilometers. There's a curve as well, and so vessels are also, so which means that they can also target vessels. So if you expand the red part, this is what it looks like. This is the expanded picture. This is the mock aircraft carrier, and they're now being moved. They're being moved over the railways. This is being seen as a missile target, and Chinese are conducting exercise using this as a missile target. And in the Taklamakan Desert, likewise, another target is set. This simulates a U.S. carrier as a potential target. So China is actually carrying out this training. They're building up such capability as we speak. But then, having said that, China, with regard to ICBM and strategic nuclear weapons, they're becoming more confident now. And it, this is demonstrated by the following. Unlike the ICBM, they're now carrying out a different type of operation. This is near the human ICBM silo construction. This is a silo for the launch of the ICBM. Already 120 silos are constructed. From this ICBM could be launched from here. If that is the case, then even private sector satellites can capture this image, which means that if the this would also be eliminated by attack, which means that the nuclear operation will change as a result of this situation. So it's, they're not returning the attack. When they see signs of attack, they can preemptively strike against the target. So China is shifting its philosophy. This is the same as the philosophy followed by the United States and Russia, which means that up until now, China was concerned that their strategic nuclear arms deterrence was low. That is why they were focused on A2AD, anti-access area. Now they wanted to top 
they wanted to add on top and access the RD node. But even strategic nuclear arms, they're becoming more confident, which means that now US and US allies will have to overcome this gap between China. That is the situation now. Next slide, please. Now from this point onwards, I hope to talk about this later on. So against this backdrop, we now have the Ukraine war, the war in Ukraine. And there are now similarities and differences being discussed when it comes to Ukraine and the Taiwan. What are similarities? The delusions of despotic political leaders in autocratic states are now the reason for this war. They're using nuclear as a threat. It has demonstrated that these leaders cannot be stopped. But does it mean that these leaders can be successful in the war? That is also very clear. So it's a, there's a contradiction that is at work here. So the contradiction will apply both to the Ukraine as well as to Taiwan. So what are the differences? There are many differences between Taiwan and Ukraine. Ukraine is an independent nation. Taiwan is considered to be a province of China, according to the Chinese perspective. That is the Chinese argument. Now, Putin, president, no matter what excuses he used, He's carrying out military expansion into a different, into a separate state. But then the Chinese will probably argue that what happens in Taiwan is within China. So it's a domestic issue. That's what the Chinese will claim. That is why there's a possibility that China may have military aggression into Taiwan. We have to consider international law. We have to consider this in the context of the international law. And also, there's a difference in the political system. In the case of China, they don't have an autocratic situation like, the, uh, like under Mr. Putin. They have a group decision-making system in China, unlike Mr. Putin's Russia. This time around, the Putin made a, uh, military aggression into the Ukraine. And even among the Chinese, Chinese leadership, some are against the policy followed by Russia. And also, Taiwan is very important for the United States. I, saw, I showed you the map earlier. So the, there's a difference in the impact on the, on the defense of the U.S. homeland. So compared to the Ukraine, the U.S. will probably more be involved in terms of defending Taiwan. There is an incentive at work here. And also, there's a, there's a strategic level difference. This is mentioned by Dr. Green. In the case of Ukraine, Ukraine and Russia, they are connected through land-based border. However, between China and Taiwan, there's the Taiwan Straits. They have to cross the war. Uh, they have to cross the ocean, rather. And crossing the war and landing their military forces could be very difficult. And also, this requires a very massive naval force. China does not have such force to, to cross the Taiwan Straits. And please leave the slide here. As was mentioned earlier, and this is covering the Ukraine session right now, China, seeing the Ukraine war, has feel, is, feel, is feeling that the hurdle to invade, invade into Taiwan is more difficult. They can begin the invasion, but then they can't they, they don't have the capacity to send that much military force, which means that the war will be prolonged and the international unity, the international community will be united. If there's an economic sanction, the authority of the Chinese Communist Party could be undermined. And also, if they want to land the forces in Taiwan, there could be a lot of casualty involved when they try to land forces in Taiwan, which means that this could lead to domestic opposition. The greatest threat for the autocratic state is domestic pressure. So if that is the case, but then they need they need to have a very large number of military forces passing the ocean. But they need to use drones. They need to invade Taiwan without using man, manned forces. That's another possibility. So then what are some of the lessons that we can learn from the war in Ukraine? First, there are lessons at the international level and lessons for the, for the, for the nation states and also lessons for the allies. Lessons for the international community. How can we deter munitions with strategic war, strategic nuclear weapons. This map shows you U.S. Pacific Deterrence Initiative. This is the Pacific Deterrence Initiative of the United States. So China's A2AD, A2AD, up until 1,500 kilometers, using strategic nuclear war, uh, nuclear war weapons, they can el eliminate U.S. forces. How do you respond against that? That is the philosophy here. For one thing, the U.S. forces need to improve their mobility. They need to distribute their forces across the more broader region. So, so relocation to Guam will be one possible, one possible option to be followed by the U.S. Marines. And also, in the first island chain, you can create precision strike network and and also, and 
they can actually counter missile bases. If they can actually notify ATAD, which may, and, at the, and in the mind, well, in the meantime, U.S. can actually respond by improving their mobility. Now, creating such a situation, demonstrating such capacity can actually serve as a deterrence. That is the objective. So, it's, so the objective is not to carry out the war. It's just to show the demonstration of the capability here. And how do you ensure deterrence, nuclear deterrence? This is another issue. So the, the so-called first island chain, right now this is mitigated national diet in Japan, and the, and the distance of the missile launch. As the missile can, becomes longer, then the issue becomes sing, uh, difficult. But I think this discussion is erroneous. This situation, this discussion could actually increase the burden on the part of Okinawa, I believe. So even, even if it's shorter, even if it's short distance, China is saying that they have the ability to strike the enemy, which means that if it's short distance, then this would uh, we have to focus on Okinawa and the Nansen Islands. But that is not the case. Japan should focus on Japan nationwide. How can Japan as a whole contribute to the maintenance of international order? If the if the range is longer, then we're talking five thousand kilometers. Which means even Hokkaido, Hokkaido could can be a deterrence against China. So it's important that we consider deterrence for Japan as nationwide. And so, in diet, they're talking about hybrid war. How to respond to hybrid war? Let's show the next slide. This is from China, South China Sea up until the Pacific Ocean, and the and this shows uh, the Chinese nuclear submarines in Hainan Island. This is the Hainan Island. This is where the warhead launched missiles. Uh, warhead. We have nuclear submarines are long, uh, stationed here. This is they can go through Taiwan and the Philippines, and they can come into the Pacific Ocean. And the United States is trying to deter that. And Australia can be involved in this. And that's that's why you have the AUKUS. So Australia's nuclear submarines are now in South China Sea, trying to stop the nuclear submarines by China. They're trying to track the Chinese nuclear submarines. Next, so what is the significance of South China Sea for the United States? This allows free access to Middle East. For Japan, this is also the same. This is for the for the U.S., this also relates to the nuclear deterrence as well. Next slide, please. So that's why China is trying to create a military base here in the South China Sea. Next slide, please. Now, in this this is a runway. Already, military planes are being operated on this runway. The KJ-500 early warning aircrafts are being operated. The fact that they are placed here means that war fighter planes are now active in this area. Next slide, please. Earlier, I talked about the hybrid war, how to respond to the so-called hybrid war. Right now, we are not in, how, to, how do you maintain freedom of the flow of data on the network, which means that cyber security and also response to fake news is also important, and also network infrastructure, how to protect network infrastructure becomes very important. This has to be considered in an integrated manner. Based on that insurance, we need to address a lot of different data. For example, the chat on SNS or online settlement, online payment, the economic and social activities need to be maintained, and also military actions will also be focused on this usage of data on the network. So how do you protect that? How do you use that is another issue which we have to consider against this backdrop. So th satellites would be part of the network infrastructure. So therefore, base stations, we need to create base stations throughout Japan. Nokinawa is one of the appropriate locations to create such a base. But then we're not just talking about base stations. Okinawa should be a hub, I believe. It's not just the military, but it's a network to be used by civilians and the private sector as well. So how do you use satellites for that purpose? And also, how do you utilize the data gained through such network? It should be a hub to consider all these issues. And also, in terms of the preventive policy, Japan and remote islands have very little in-depth capacity, we have to consider the in-depth defense. What about the allies, lesson for the allies? We talk about how Japan could be involved in the war involving the United States, but the Europe is concerned about the following. When they, when they are the, the subject of aggression, how can they ensure U.S. military involvement? That is what the, the Europeans are concerned about right now. So we need to consider U.S.-Japan allies in, in that context as well. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, the military strategy 
as a military expert, and thank you very much uh, for in-depth presentation. We would like to have a deeper discussion later on. Pro uh, Associate Professor Yamamoto, I'm supposed to be an anchor speaker, so I have to catch up. So I will be very brief. I'm starting with page two. Now, I'm in charge of the analytical review of uh, base issues in Okinawa, the second page. Now, speaking of uh, the base issues in Okinawa, this is a kind of an image. About 70% of U.S. forces are located in Okinawa, and this has to be addressed. But at the same time, I would like and to start uh, with the SOFA. That is going to be the starting point. It is difficult to understand when it comes to SOFA. What is difficult to understand? You will not be able to understand clearly what are the real issues by just reading it. In 2004, there was the helicopter that hit uh, the, the building uh, of the Okinawa University, the International University, and Governor uh, Inamine uh, was uh, involved, and there were also those uh, students uh, uh, who were uh, just a small children. So long time, we have been um, sick and tired of uh, the long-standing uh, the base issues, and at the same time, uh, all those uh, issues have been complicated. And when the helicopter hit at the building of the university, uh, the U.S. Uh, forces uh, and the military personnel called on the area, and that was not uh, written in the script uh, or the text. Instead, agreed minutes uh, enabled the U.S. authorities to call on off. In that way, it is quite difficult to fully understand the situation. And that is uh, as a result that there is a complicated uh, feeling uh, among the population of Okinawa. And that uh, uh, hinders uh, the solution of the problems. And what is uh, most uh, problematic is in relation uh, with the possible contingency in the Taiwan Straits. Uh, this uh, photo shows uh, the um, the local protest, uh, civilian motor report. Those uh, fishers associations um, assembled and together, together with the demonstrators, and to block the entry of U.S. military boat. It was uh, not directly related into anti-base movement. Rather, uh, I think it is clear and to the local people. Instead, uh, those activists, but those uh, fishermen, um, that uh, together. The local citizens got involved in this kind of demonstration in order to prevent the U.S. military boats. It is a matter of life instead of just ideology here in Okinawa. In the case of Taiwan Strait contingency, the civilian airports and ports, how they are going to be used by the U.S. military, that is going to be important. The peacetime training is important and for using it uh, in, in the contingency. And the SOFA enables them and to do so. At the same time, it is politically difficult and to do so in the peacetime in Okinawa because of uh, their uh, willingness to protect their own life and also anger and sadness against the U.S. presence. Therefore, when it comes to the civilian airports and ports, the local citizens uh, would not like and to let the U.S. Uh, use, uh, use it. In Tokyo, there, there's a lot of discussion about the nuclear sharing or missiles. Uh, but uh, aside, putting that aside, in Okinawa, the peacetime uh, ex military exercises uh, uh, are not something and that are easy to understand. So we have to do something about this. Uh, two pages ahead, yes, like this one. Uh, in Okinawa main island, there are a lot of uh, U.S. dedicated bases and facilities. And the movement uh, from bases to ba other bases, the Marine Corps uh, uses those as, uh, bases uh, for the training. That means uh, all across the island, they move around. And that means they fly over the residential areas all the time. And that is the cause of the real problems. So this is how the situation in the mainland, um, but in other remote islands, uh, if for example, that there's going to be a similar um, problem that take place uh, in remote areas. Those uh, your islands, uh, Yonagunijima, um, declares that it would not accept any U.S. military exercises. <coughs> in order to protect the daily life in Okinawa, the people in Okinawa 
uh, express uh, anger and opposition unto the U.S. Uh, military trainings. And how we are going to address this? This is the next topic I would like to talk about. This is a video, and the video can start if the castle uh, is placed on the top. Right. This uh, is um, the daily site at the University of the Ryukyu. So almost every day, the U.S. military aircraft are flying over F-35 or helicopters, for example. Even if it is just a single helicopter, it is a huge noise. And if there are going to be a, quadron, uh, a squadron of helicopters, it is going to be a huge noise. That means uh, that the, we will not be able to teach anything. Uh, but uh, the English listening tests uh, were uh, carried out during this kind of uh, huge background noise. This is a, a lot of a nuisance. There is an agreement between the two governments, so that agreement has to be complied with. Uh, that would be the starting point. It is a low-key issue. It is not going to be a full-fledged uh, revision of the SOFA. Instead, we have the agreements at the joint committee between the two countries. We and then based on that agreement, uh, that early, uh, the late night and early morning exercise over the populated areas uh, should not be, uh, re should be pr restricted, and that, could, that is going to be the starting point. And uh, otherwise, and that it is difficult and for the local people to accept uh, the cooperation toward the military exercise and military operations uh, in the contingency. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Yamamoto. As you have rightly said, uh, the issue to do with the uh, Japan-US status of force agreement that is not really widely understood and uh, recognized uh, even inside her Japan that perhaps we need to deepen uh, our understanding and appreciation of this. Having said so, what uh, uh, Dr. Yamamoto has said and what Ambassador Sugiyama has said uh, to the people of importance in the United States, we need to communicate in detail and explain in detail uh, what uh, has been happening to Okinawa and during uh, the keynote speech. Uh, my, uh, Dr. Michael Green was saying that once again, uh, perhaps uh, we need uh, to refresh our understanding and recognition uh, of the issue to do with Okinawa, Japan, U.S., and perhaps between Tokyo and Okinawa. Uh, in view of uh, the security uh, developments uh, more recently, that PRC's risk seems to be heightening, so what should be uh, the communication between the two is my question. So Dr. Yamamoto, may I ask you first, uh, the national government in Tokyo, uh, should the government uh, need to talk with Okinawa or should the government of Japan need to talk with the U.S. government? What should be made clear and what should be discussed and negotiated or how to expand and broaden the understanding, if you could give us more of a detail. This is a very difficult question. Uh, uh, the issue has been too long standing, uh, and uh, uh, the politically, people are divided. For Okinawa, the base issue uh, at the working level, at the officials' level, uh, under uh, the, the water, so to speak, they need to speak with each other. but. All sorts of citizens at the various levels are involved, and there is a heated uh, a report by media. Everything has become uncontrollable. That seems to be the difficulty. You cannot really ignore Okinawa and have U.S. government and government of Japan just to talk each other. Politically, is not advisable. But if you want to speak with Okinawa, you should avoid the becoming a political performance. You need to have uh, the more sincere political debate. So how to control the situation matters and importance. You talked about political performance. Just by having dialogue, uh, that could uh, be taken to be just an alibi uh, for the government. So Ambassador Sugiyama, how about you? What should be the communication between Tokyo and Naha? And, uh, the dialogue between Tokyo and Washington. Now, if I may try to sort out and straighten out the situation, 
uh, the interpretation and how to operate the SOFA uh, and uh, the Joint Committee. This is government to government at the level issue, uh, the national uh, the government to national government. Of course, to from local government to a foreign government, you can have a dialogue, but that would not lead to any solution because it involves sovereignty of a nation. And as uh, what the Dr. Yamamoto has been suggesting, so between Okinawa and the national government of Japan, that is say Tokyo, so between Tokyo and Naha, the frank communication seems to be suspended, is what I have been told yesterday. And that is not good. Whatever the situation, you need to have better communication and try to go step by step in trying to bring solution. Unless you talk to each other, you would never ever be able to reach a solution. So both uh, the have a different arguments and different contentions, I'm sure, but the Naha and Tokyo needs to speak to each other. And I don't think anybody would object to this. And having said so, I'm not trying uh, to, to be uh, the, uh, the devil here, but the experts on uh, the U.S. Uh, forces base and uh, the uh, Japan-U.S. security matters, uh, that is important. But uh, I don't think uh, uh, that is uh, the crux of the question, but Japan-U.S. Uh, alliance people who have the being uh, trying to um, uh, to uh, the belittle this that's to say just the experts uh, and uh, the, the uh, Pentagon uh, the the working level officials and uh, the Japanese uh, the side uh, defense ministry and security uh, experts uh, to work out the details at the working level I used to be uh, a part of this team, uh, I had the was an official at the foreign ministry in charge of uh, the U.S.-Japan alliance, but uh, that should not be uh, the case. Uh, the people with the younger generation uh, try to work out the details and uh, bring the issue up to the minister. The matter is much, much grave and much, much more important than that uh, today. That should not be the level. I'm not trying to say that politicians should lead the way, but the U.S., it is top-down, and uh, the bureaucracy is not that strong. In Japan, uh, Japan was more of a bureaucratic nation, and I thought that bureaucrats are quite strong and powerful. I do believe that. But uh, bureaucrats don't have the legitimacy in a democratic nation. In a democracy, those who are elected by the people are given uh, the mandate and authority. Japan is not a dictatorship. Japan is a democracy. So Japan-U.S. alliance should not uh, be an official's working level alliance. It should be more of a higher level, highest level. Political decision making must be done. Uh, of course, uh, Tony Blinken has not been chosen uh, by uh, the, uh, the people, but the president uh, is chosen by the people. So at the higher level, the highest level, unless you have the dialogue at that level, you cannot really make decisions. Japan-U.S. alliance, even compared to the older alliance, has become so important. I have keenly felt, as I visited the United States in many places, not at the director general level, but the ministers, cabinet ministers, the top-level people at the White House are interested in this matter and asking for explanation. When I explain, I found that they do not really understand fully. So that is the reason why I made the suggestions earlier. Yes, under the current situation, U.S. as a country is, is somewhat weaker, and the Biden government is trying to involve their allies. They want to make sure that the burdens are shared equally among the allies. In terms of China policy, U.S.-Japan alliance is going to be the linchpin. This is something that has been repeatedly mentioned by the president. And also the important officials are making the same statement, but we're not sure about the details. What is actually happening in details? Are they really aware of the details? I think we need to scrutinize this even more. People on the front lines and the government officials and politicians on the, on the on the front lines need to address this. Now, Mr. Ohara, let me turn to you. You give a very quick overview of the Chinese military buildup. You mentioned how that they're building up the military capacity. 
You talked about the most recent photos of the Takamaka Desert. This, I believe, is a photo from April, just last month, isn't it? That was quite uh, shocking. Now, going forward, if I could ask you this question intentionally, going forward, if the Okinawa U.S. forces are so present in Okinawa, do you think that Okinawa could be the next target of China? Is there a possibility that Okinawa could emerge as a target for China? Your thoughts, Mr. Ohada. Yes, thank you for your question. Well, in terms of contingency, in terms of conflict, where are we in terms of the stages of the conflict and contingency? U.S. and China, they're not looking to engage in war. As I mentioned earlier, they're showing political capacity. They're trying to deter each other through political deterrence. And the, according to U.S. think tank, they have various uh, publicized reports. They're saying that China will, un China will avoid attacking U.S. bases until the very end. But then when it comes to hybrid warfare, this is actually through a, a warfare involving non-military measures. But in the case of Korean War, hybrid war, stops all the lifelines. They also blockade ports and airports. They stop the supply of forces. Food and water will not be brought in as a result of the hybrid war here. And they take over the resilience of the uh, of their society. So this is very inhumane. Hybrid warfare can be quite inhumane. And also, they try to attempt isolation when it comes to information. They don't know what is going on in the environment. They're, con they're they're holed up in uh, underground. They have nothing to eat, nothing to drink. If that's the case, they will be psychologically very, very depressed. So creating such a situation, they actually invade into the other region. They avoid military confrontation. Russia is trying to avoid military confrontation, but then that was a failure. The Ukrainians re rebelled, and as a result, the civilians are not being killed off by the Russians as a result of the opposition by the Ukraine. But then Mr. Putin will not declare war against NATO, because if they declare war on NATO, they know that they will be damaged. And China is the same for China as well. So that being the case, we talked about expanded nuclear deterrence earlier. So with regard to the questions, of, there are two questions pertaining to U.S. nuclear deterrence expansion. First. There's an argument that people will be involved in U.S. military warfare. It, the Japanese and Okinawans, Okinawans are not looking to be involved in U.S. military conflict, but that they could be involved. The other argument, this is concerning Europe. When they're attacked, the U.S. will not act. So there is a, a distrust. So there are two aspects here. So you have to consider these two aspects. In particular, when it comes to Japan, Japan lived in a dreamland, believing that the world was at peace. But then Okinawa alone was faced with very stark reality, even against this backdrop. So that being the case, Japan at last has woken up as a result of the war in Ukraine. At least the government and the LDP has woken up against the very stark reality. So how do they act against this new reality? This will demonstrate whether or not Japan can share the same recognition when it comes to Okinawa. Once we have the same recognition, how can we respond to the distribution of U.S. military forces in Japan? What are some of the essential components of the U.S. military forces? We need to consider that. One, we need to consider how we can d distribute the burden. That's what we need to consider. Thank you. I thank you very much. So Okinawa has Okinawa is on the front lines. Okinawa is indeed on the front lines of national security. And the Okinawan people, they have very high awareness of the situation, don't they? They really have learned a great deal about the situation. They're much more cognizant when it comes to the situation compared to people on the mainland. So against the backdrop, Mr. Ohara, you talked about the recognition of Okinawa. How can we share the perception and the recognition of Okinawa with the people on the mainland? That needs to be done at the political level as well. We need to consider the burden on the part of Okinawa. Also, what threat is Japan faced with? We need to consider that aspect as well. That, I believe, is very important. Now, we talked about direct attack on Okinawa, Mr. Ohara. You talked about direct attack on Okinawa. But what about Taiwan Straits? In the keynote lecture, we received many questions about the Taiwan Straits. What about the Taiwan Straits emergency and contingency, concerns of the Taiwan contingency? 
Can Japan become embroiled in this situation? How can Japan support the United States? How can Japan ensure involvement of, of the United States? How do we strike a balance? How do you see that? I know this is a maybe dialogue with the United States, but how do you see that, Ohara-san? Okay, thank you. According to the opinion poll of Taiwan in the recent month, well, the US, there's a sense, there's a high sense of distrust that Taiwan people do not believe that Japan, that the US will support Taiwan when they are the subject of military uh, invasion. When there's military aggression into Taiwan, they might actually, what might happen is maritime blockade, airtime, uh, air blockade might be done in order to prevent any involvement of the United States. This is part of the Chinese plan. If that is the case, that the non-sexual islands of Japan could actually place under the military control of the PLA and the Chinese authorities. Yanomino Ishigu Miyako, these islands at minimum will fall under the control based on the Chinese operation. Osumi Straits could actually be subject to a maritime blockade. If that is the case, in the case of Japan, it's no longer a matter of being involved. Japan will become a party to this conflict. That's a possibility. And also, the U.S. They're trying to, if they act to defend Taiwan, then Japan will have to support the U.S. in their defense in their defense of Taiwan. Then for the Chinese, China, uh, for China, for China, then Japan will be a, a, a party involved in the U.S. military operations. That's how the Chinese may perceive the situation. So if that is the case, in the face of the Taiwan contingency, Japan can no longer be a bystander. But then, having said that, if Japan does nothing. Taiwan could be taken away by China. Is that okay? Is that acceptable? If that is the case, in the international context, it means that you can do anything as long as you use military force. Right now, U.S. and Europe are are trying to prevent Putin from being successful any longer. They want to avoid the creation of such an international order where anyone can do anything with military force. And this could happen in East Asia. If that were to happen in East Asia, that this could actually have lessons not only involving China, but also it could, could, the possibility that other countries could move to take such action. We should avoid creation of such an international order. And also, uh, once under military control, Japan's sovereignty could no longer be applicable in those areas. If you surrender, you can remain, you can maintain freedom, free and peaceful life. That is not the case. This became very clear in the war in Ukraine. So areas under the Russian control, what what are the lives of Ukrainians under the areas that are under Russian control? When you consider that, Japan should not see Taiwan intermittent emergency as someone else's problem. Now, as far as we're concerned, we uh, researchers are like researchers like ourselves need to communicate that to people outside to Okinawa. Okay, you need to make sure we send the message to people in Tokyo as well as in LTP. So that I believe is the mission on the part of the uh, researchers like ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think uh, the tension is rising around the world. And once again, Professor Yamamoto, you have some basis in Okinawa. As a reality, they do exist here on this island. And in the immediate uh, future, it is not going to, uh, to uh, be reduced. And that means uh, this reality has to be accepted and by the Okinawans. Coexistence with the U.S. Uh, forces or U.S. bases is a very tricky word for Okinawans. How the Okinawa government and the Japanese government will be able to encourage them, local people, to understand better. There is a misunderstanding in this regard. Uh, the majority uh, of uh, the Okinawans believe uh, that uh, there is uh, there, there should be a U.S. Uh, forces uh, um, for the Japan security. It was uh, expressed uh, in the NHK poems. And at different universities, I am teaching, and then coexistence uh, with the bases. And I think uh, there are more students in favor of that kind of idea. Uh, there is uh, a very few uh, students, or uh, Okinawans, uh, who say that the U.S. basis and should be abolished totally. That kind of number is decreasing gradually. But at the same time, even uh, among those in favor of the basis, they 
consider it a serious issue. That means it is not a matter of uh, ideology. Instead, it is a matter of uh, their uh, daily life. In our own life, uh, inconvenience is caused and some uh, harm, for example, the safe water or living calmly and uh, uh, sleeping calmly in, at night. And in the case of an accident and an incident, there's some areas are going to be cordoned off. There are uh, some uh, concerns and anger, and they have to be eliminated uh, by some ways. For the majority of Okinawans, uh, they are in favor of the, the security treaty and have understanding of the existence of the basis. I understand. Right. I think it is a kind of an intergenerational issue. There are going to be some nuances, differences of nuances across the generations. So because of uh, the, the last war in Okinawa and the memory of uh, the U.S. military occupation in the post-war era, there are still a lot of uh, people at the same time, a younger generation, who are emerging on the island. I think there are different kinds of nuances um, across uh, the generations. I think so. I think there are intergenerational issues. I've been living in Okinawa for 10 years, uh, so I'm a newcomer still. But there are those, uh, I think, uh, those uh, who are on the 90s who have the experience of uh, the Okinawa war. And those, I think, most of them are in the 60s who have experience of living under U.S. military occupation. Most of the students uh, were born in the, 20, uh, in the 2000s, and they didn't know anything about uh, the girls' rape in 1995. And also, the U.S. military uh, aircraft uh, uh, the hitting the building. And uh, I think it is uh, just taken for granted uh, for them and to buy coffee at Starbucks together uh, with the American soldiers. It is not a matter of uh, ideology anymore. So there should not be any misunderstanding on this part. There is, they do, um, the uh, Okinawan people uh, are viewed that, that they um, do not recognize the importance of the security. That is not the case. Now, we received many questions from the audience, and uh, one of uh, the things I would like to ask, uh, pick up, is that this is a question addressed to all the panelists. So, this kind of uh, hybrid warfare, data-centric and cyber uh, attacks, uh, it is a kind of uh, uh, informal uh, warfare, so to speak. Uh, there are servers and there are also some facilities and to be located in Okinawan Island. Instead of uh, just a military base, but also, as O'Hara-san mentioned, uh, in some of the facilities, and that can be dual used. Uh, the concentration of such facilities and to be um, promoted uh, in Okinawa. To what extent uh, is this kind of initiative uh, promoted? Network infrastructure is to be destroyed uh, within this uh, framework of uh, um, the, the, this kind of new warfare. The central hub is located in Tokyo when it comes to internet. Uh, one single node is uh, going to be destroyed. There will be no possibility of further communication. So they should be distributed locally. And that is a realistic option we have to consider. So. Within this kind of uh, mindset and the framework, uh, some kind of facility can be located in Okinawa. But uh, we have not fully discussed uh, what site uh, will be most suitable for this kind of facility. Now, speaking of the hybrid warfare, not only in the cyber space, but the network that will be able to build the cyber space, uh, including the satellites, they should be considered in an integrated manner. Therefore, I think uh, the underground cable and undersea cable, and uh, they have to be installed. They are supposed to be most vulnerable, and uh, the uh, the network on the ground is going to be connected uh, with the undersea cables. How they are going to be protected is an issue. Therefore, that the ground stations are connecting the undersea cables, uh, or the, the Taiwan uh, is uh, considering uh, several options uh, for the protection. I think the Japanese government should also consider this kind of possibility. We should avoid um, the information level isolation. 
uh, not only the government military, but also the civilian sector should be concentrated. Elon Musk uh, has provided the Starlink to Ukraine. Starlink is a private sector uh, network can be used uh, for the military purposes. Internet itself originally came from the U.S. military. Therefore, in the uh, information world, this kind of idea should be integrated. Thank you very much. Now, on Japan-U.S. so far, status, status of forces uh, agreement. Uh, these are questions uh, had to Ambassador Sugiyama as well as uh, Dr. Yamamoto. For so far agreement, as uh, Dr. Yamamoto has often uh, said, uh, the agreed minutes. So even though the agreement itself does not mention this, but in the minutes, there are agreement between uh, the two governments, and that may be also relevant. So for Japan and US so far, there are issues and challenges to do with this. Now, with the between United States and NATO members, are these issues uh, also contentious? So with the United States, to what extent uh, can we argue on this? So can I start with uh, Dr. Yamamoto? Your question was, if I may clarify, on uh, the agreed the minutes of SOFA, now between NATO members and the United States, are these similar issues? For example, even though Something is not mentioned in the agreement itself, but when it comes to actual operation, there could be issues between the U.S. and the NATO the members. The point I'm trying to get at is, when it comes to so far, is there differential treatment by the United States against Japan and against the NATO members? There are historical developments. When it was West Germany, West Germany, used to have uh, a different uh, unfair, more of an unofficial agreement with the United States. Uh, for example, in terms of uh, uh, the judicial uh, the rights, uh, the West Germany uh, have abandoned and uh, have re released over to the United States. Uh, but uh, there has been revision uh, to the supplementary agreement for the unified Germany right now it is on par with uh, Japan, uh, the judicial uh, the right. Uh, not, it is just limited to heinous crime, but the primary, uh, the right uh, of uh, justice are given over to Germany. When the SOFA was first established, the NATO as well as Japan were not that different. But in the 1990s and onwards, Germany and Italy has revised the agreement, and to the civilians, the so far have uh, been changed so that it will be easy to be explained to the citizens that the sovereignty and are more given over uh, to the host nation. And also for uh, Republic of Korea, they have twice revised the so far, and they had have uh, come to the level of Japan that they were able to secure the equality, so to speak. But in Japan, uh, at the time of 1960, uh, the occupation times have uh, sort of lingered on uh, to uh, the SOFA agreement, which persists today. And that uh, is behind the difference between Japan and NATO members. So Ambassador Sugiyama. Please. Now, what Dr. Yamamoto has suggested just now, I'm not trying to deny what she has said, but for us, including myself, I have directly and indirectly been the party uh, to such consultations. On so far, the so-called joint uh, committee agreement. I believe there is a, jo a joint uh, uh, the e minutes separately for so far, but uh, that is not what she is bringing up. So this is the joint the committee, uh, the, the minutes, that there is an agreement of the joint the committee at the level uh, for the operation of the SOFA agreement. There are all sorts of uh, different things included. So what Dr. Yamamoto 
uh, for the highness uh, the crime uh, for the judicial right that has been transparently been uh, published. There are some things which are not published. Where to the, draw the line is basically decided by the government, and there lies the opaqueness. That is the criticism. But uh, how the government has decided, I am no longer active with the member of the government. But when I was still an active member, uh, it is confidential, so I don't think I uh, am able to mention this. But basically, from the public eye, uh, it has been for issues that need to be transparently explained. Uh, the joint uh, uh, the committee agreement has been made public. But it, this, if it is highly technical and too much of a detail, uh, that there are things which have not been made public. And that has been the separation between the two. And uh, so far, um, uh, Japan has never talked about the revision of the agreement, uh, but uh, of what is called the host nation support agreement. Up until recently, of course, recently there has been a new agreement uh, that being concluded, which is even beyond uh, the host nation support agreement. Uh, this is something different from Article 24, because uh, larger burden has been taken over by uh, Japan. Now, what was the development behind the scenes? On the host nation support agreement, when it was concluded, I have uh, been involved, so I do know uh, what has ensued. But uh, the document has not been made public yet because it is still confidential and classified. I don't think I can mention this. But what was argued at the time was, and it is true even to today, uh, with the uh, the special the measures of the agreement, the just for five years, that was how it was explained. So there was a time limit. And uh, it has been suspended for one year. Uh, but uh, uh, that there has been provisional agreement had uh, been concluded, but ever since the initial agreement, the substance has been changed slightly. Every time it has been renewed, it has been renewed. So the Article 24 itself had not been changed. So legally speaking, that is not a mistaken explanation, but even going beyond Article 24 uh, for the Japanese government to take on the burden. Uh, you need uh, to have the approval of the parliament. So, for example, uh, the environmental agreement uh, that was uh, reached uh, on uh, the environment, a special agreement uh, that was actually uh, drafted and concluded. So there has been slight change in the Article 24, actually, uh, to, uh, to explain more transparently uh, what is uh, uh, done even beyond what is written under Article 17, for example, and the so-called host nation support, uh, the Article 24 or, or Article 14 or Article 17, including the Environment Agreement, the Bonn Agreement, or the other the SOFA, uh, the agreement itself has been revised and amended, which is different from the case of Japan. But when you look at the content and substance, Japan has actually made revisions after revision then why don't the government actually explain on this is exactly the point I was trying to make. So internally, what is being uh, discussed should not uh, be made uh, at the public, so there are limits to what we can say. But to a certain extent, uh, since I have uh, quit my job from the government, as I said uh, earlier, what is the thinking within the government? Because anti American and anti-Japan-US security had the pact, and anti-base, uh, that, that you could uh, drill a hole, and that, that could lead uh, to, indeed, very contentious uh, the, uh, the argument and the debate. When the SOFA uh, agreement was drafted initially, that may have been the case. But if for today, the people in Okinawa, it is not that I know that many people, but uh, Dr. Yamamoto, her students, mostly, they think that this is not to do with ideology. This is exactly what uh, involves their own livelihood, uh, the, be it the Futema, other base, or be it uh, otherwise. It is too noisy. And uh, they would like to relocate to other places. It is not that they are trying uh, to kick out the Americans. Categorically, that is not the case. And the U.S. doesn't understand it. Even 
the government of Japan do, don't really understand this. So you need to, to look at higher level to try to explain. And uh, if the government of Japan needs to also explain and communicate with the people in Okinawa. That is exactly the point I was trying to make earlier. I'm afraid we're fast running out of time. So this will be the final question to the panelists. This is to all the panelists, a question for all the three panelists. We talked about deterrence. In this session, one of the topics was, deter was deterrence. In, are there ways in which Okinawa can contribute to non-military deterrence? There are a lot of different forms of threats out there. There are a lot of national security related threats. Against this context, in the case of uh, Ukraine, the economic sanctions served as a deterrence. And uh, many countries united to provide economic, uh, economic sanctions. This became a topic, and the international community moved to provide sanctions. So seeing the situation in Ukraine, we're able to learn a lot of lessons and insights. So how can Okinawa contribute in providing national security in a non-military manner? Are there ways in which Okinawa could contribute in non-military terms when it comes to security? This is a topic which I really haven't given much thought. But what can Okinawa do in a non-military manner when it comes to national security? So shall we start with Ambassador Sugema, then on to Obara-san, and then on to Dr. Yamamoto. Thank you. This is a very important point. Be it military, be it political, yes, there are a lot of deterrence. But the importance of Okinawa is economic development. Economic, economic development. If Okinawa development, if Okinawa economic could develop, then this would, this would be a major deterrent. If Okinawa were to serve as a hub for economy, then this could actually be very important in terms of deterrence, because if, if this will be a major deterrence for the Japanese national security. So it's not just a matter of providing subsidy, make sure the people of Okinawa are compensated for the burden. That is no longer the philosophy we should follow. It's important that Okinawa economy become, it's, itself becomes very strong, because this will be a major deterrence. This will serve as major deterrence for the Japanese economy as a whole. Thank you very much. Ohara-san, any thoughts? Yes, I believe the basis for national security should be economy. I agree with that thinking. To be more specific, what, what can we do more specifically? Okay, it's important that Okinawa become a hub. In the case of Singapore, it's a, it's a logistics hub. Okinawa should emerge as a hub of something. It's important that people of all the world gather in Okinawa because Okinawa is a hub, a hub that can be realized. It should be information and data and knowledge and information. The cyberspace. Does, it goes beyond limitations of time and, and time and space. So therefore, going forward, virtual space and augmented reality should become an issue. Hopefully, Okinawa could emerge as a hub for these technologies. It, once we have the flag, then many, many, many people will flock to Okinawa. This could be a deterrence of sorts. If, if, if different countries believe that Okinawa is important, then many people will be loath to attack Okinawa. I see the Dr. Ya, Dr. Yamamoto, please. Thank you. When it comes to hybrid war warfare, data manipulation will become very important. So fake news, spread of fake news could take place. Ohara-san is an expert. Um, I don't want to speak in front of the expert Ohara-san, but I guess the backdrop, Okinawa could be a weak link between Taiwan and Japan. For example, the fake news provided Russia was reported as top news because the enemy of an enemy is a friend. You have the base issue because you hate the United States. You take the news of Russia because you hate the United States. But that's not the case. We should not believe enemy of the enemy. Now, Okinawa has traditionally, has traditionally a lot of exchanges between Taiwan and Okinawa. And there are various mirrors of the past. I really worked hard to provide exchange between Taiwan and Okinawa over the many years. And there are a lot of prefecture offices also based in Taiwan as well. And also retired U.S. force military. They tend to stay in Okinawa, and they assimilate into the local community, and they have exchanges with local Okinawans. We have such examples. So in terms of the people of Okinawans, have a sense of trust with people of the U.S. and Taiwan. They have built such relationship more than people on the mainland in Japan. So it's important that not be. It's important that we prevent any fake news from coming into 
Okinawa. Okay, we should not have fake news break the relations between Japan and Taiwan and Japan and the United States. It's important that we resolve this base issue. It's important that the the feeling of Okinawa has been moderated as a result. Thank you very much and for all the insightful observations. I think we are running out of time. I should have asked more questions. There are many more to come, as a matter of fact. But uh, most of the major issues I wanted to cover, for example, Tokyo, Washington, and Okinawa, there should be the deeper understanding between the three. And that is uh, the most significant uh, issue. And the immediate and security condition, which is uh, getting more serious. And going forward, it is difficult for us to think that it is going to ameliorate. Therefore, once again, Tokyo, Okinawa, and Washington, they have and to work together in order to have better understanding. And the mass media should also play a due role. Economic and development uh, was also one of the topics we talked about. And in the next session, we are going to have a, a delve into that issue. With that, I would like to close the session. Thank you very much.